Why do we travel? Humans are on a voyage of discovery. And each time we travel, we leave tracks so others can follow and take the next step. This is heaven. For 50 years, Lonely Planet has laid a path. We've visited more than 21,000 destinations and printed more than 150 million guides. We've built a global network of diverse local voices. Connected millions on our award-winning social networks and forged lasting partnerships to elevate destinations and brands. A new era of Lonely Planet is beginning. One more committed than ever to real local voices. These are the sounds of my city. With decades of experience built into cutting edge tools, an era focused on how you travel and why. So continue the journey with us. And we'll see you out there. Lonely Planet, adventures that move you since 1973. Welcome back to our live coverage of the AWS Summit in LA. I'm A.M. Gravelny. First of all, I loved, they were featuring my shoes in, really? that, in that video that just rolled. Yeah, I got the checkerboard. I, I like I'll this. show you down here, checkerboard. Bring, bring, bring it up, bring it up. Oh, uh, nice, nice. Checkerboard. Nice. Uh, anyway, moving on, uh, I'm joined by my co-host, Aaron Hunter, please. Hi, I'm Aaron Hunter. Uh, I am also a principal developer advocate, but I work on the training certification team, and I'm here with Chris. Hello, my name is Chris White, and I lead engineering and data at Lonely Planet. All right, Chris, we're here to talk about Lonely Planet and uh, what you all are doing with Bedrock. Sure. So, you know, we've been talking all day about generative AI, as you could probably assume. We even have the AI hub right behind us. We do. Yes. It's, it's fun talking about this stuff from a technical perspective. It's fun talking about what these things can do. It's fun seeing the possibilities. But to me, it's even more fun hearing about the realities. Like, what are you all actually doing with this at Lonely Planet? How the customers are using exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what we're going to be talking about with you today. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, can you, can you give us, first off, let's hear about Lonely Planet. What, what you all, uh, I know you're making travel amazing, first of all. Thank uh, you. But for any of those who are not familiar with Lonely Planet, can you tell us a little bit about your mission, how you were making travel amazing? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. So we've really been around since 1973, focused on people-centric, ungoogleable travel experiences. It started in 1973 with a guidebook that was you know, all about exploring Asia on a shoestring budget. And from there, it turned into producing over 150 million guidebooks. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and you know the interesting thing about Lonely Planet, we were also one of the first guidebook publishers to jump into sort of a digital experience with LP.com. We released and then retracted several mobile app experiences. Um, so you know, for us, it's always been about being the traveler's expert best friend and showing you the things that you know you can't find easily on the internet when you're in a new destination. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we like to call that the ungoogleable, but also how to do a place, right? Because sometimes it, you know, you may think, okay, I'm looking at a map, I, I can do these two things because they're close and I'm gonna check them both off on the same day. But the reality is maybe you shouldn't because you should spend a little bit more time in one place or another. So, you know, we started really with that travel guidebook and then I brought a couple of examples here. You know, we've got the iconic guidebook for Sicily and then the travel hack handbook, which is one of our trade and reference uh, books. And mm. then also our best in travel 2024, Can I take which, a look at that? yeah, absolutely. Do you want this back? No, this is for you guys. <laughs> you can wow. fight over it. Wow. <laughs> wow. Aaron just taking stuff, huh? Sp sponsored by Lonely Planet today, okay? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Chris, I have to ask before we jump into the tech, what's your, what's your dream vacation? And have you taken it already? I have not taken it. My dream vacation is to go to Antarctica because wow. it's the last continent that I haven't been to. Fun fact about me, I've been to more countries than states. Really? Wow. Yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, yeah. this, this, this whole job you've taken on not really a job, more of a passion, it sounds like. It's a, it's a dream. Okay. You can't say you yeah. have a favorite child, but do you have a favorite country? Oh, I, I shouldn't say I'm okay. in trouble. <laughs> you know, I, I, w I, w I will say, you know, I love Italian food, so Italy is definitely okay. always up there. You can whisper it to me. No one else is listening. Yeah, they are. Okay. Yeah, they, the entire internet <laughs> is listening, actually, Aaron. Uh, okay, so let's get into, you know, at the, the question that everyone is asking of their companies, I think, at this point. 
how is generative AI going to fit into my business plan? So how are you all at Lonely Planet looking at generative AI? Yeah, one of the things at Lonely Planet that I think we did differently was really taking a step back, getting out of sort of the leadership room and pulling SME, subject matter experts from across our company, really a cross-functional group of people together, we posed that question to them. And it was really interesting that when you take a whole company approach to any sort of new endeavor, it's definitely a, a lot less frictionful. So, you know, a few things really matter to us. You know, we are always going to be about real people and lived experiences. Yes. Anybody can create a trip using any AI tool that's out there right now. We have to maintain you know, the, the, the nuance, the, the, the specialty that is Lonely Planet. And so, you know, we really put together a set of guiding principles that we still follow today. And that was incredibly okay. important to us. And that included uh, individuals from across our different teams. And, you know, what was really interesting is it very much aligned with the culture that we already had. Um, I think what happens in these types of endeavors where companies bring on new technology like generative AI, Leadership says, we've got to do this, it's going to be amazing, but they don't necessarily ask the people that are out there every day doing the work, how should we, how should we do this? And we're still learning, right? We're, sure. we're really just getting started in this whole journey. Uh, but that's how, that's how we started. We actually asked as many people as we could that exact question. Wow. Like you mentioned one phrase, and it's the ungoogleable. Yes. Living life and doing the things that you can't just search the internet for and then learning from that and then listening to your customers and then iterating over that so that way other people can find the ungoogleable. I, I, I mean, I experience this in my own life all the time with all types of different things. Like there's this, there's this art of curation that I feel like uh, can evaporate in the digital world that we live in. Yes. So it's amazing to me to hear that you all are, you know, how seriously you take that. Um, now, you know, we're here to talk bedrock, obviously, too. You all are, are, are exploring with bedrock, building with bedrock. Uh, what drew you to that? You know, I think when we were looking at, at different options, you know, we started off with, with looking at some com competitor models mm -hmm. uh, against our use case and started kind of testing with that. When Bedrock was not GA yet, you know, we talked to our account team, and when they explained sort of the interoperability of foundational models, yeah. that was a really big point that we wanted to explore. The other one was that our data and our content not leaving our VPC and not training any third-party models. For us, this is, this is our business, right? right the content yeah. is our business. And for us, what we didn't want to do is with any utility that we create for our customer, we did not want to train other models or have that data going into areas that we couldn't have control. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And yeah. How do you do this from like a cost saving standpoint? Because when you're training your models, you need vast amounts of data. You need to constantly work on training the models and improving those models, and then like you iterate over it. There's this definition of like, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, right? But with machine learning, you kind of have to. Yeah, look, I think from my perspective, one of the big pushes that, that I challenged the team with was, you know, you're really going to have to justify me why you need to train a model. Mm -hmm. Much of what we've done, and in fact, the production use case that if we have time, we'll, we'll take a quick look at the, the outcome yeah. of, of that work, um, you know, that is not based on a fine-tuned model. That is leveraging foundational models on bedrock. So I think a lot of companies get started and they make two mistakes. The first mistake is they pick the technology before they really understand the problem that they want to solve. And the second mistake is they immediately run towards fine-tuning a model, which actually is only really needed in probably a very small subset of the use cases companies are working on today. Yeah. yeah. That first problem applies to so many areas of technology, not just, you know, uh, ML. It, it's, that is like, in engineering teams that I've been in, people fall in love with their technologies, right? And yeah. uh, sometimes fit these technologies in when they are not appropriate to fit in. Are so. you saying there's a shiny rock somewhere? <laughs> Some kind of shiny <laughs> object? I'm saying everybody should be programming with C Sharp, okay? Everyone. Oh, wow. no, I'm just kidding. Okay. I'm not taking that stance. Oh, okay. I'm joking. Tell, You're me not how, tell me how you really feel. C -sharp. I do love C Sharp. C Sharp or Rust? Uh, C Sharp, but let's move on. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, Chris, well, yeah. uh, look, my opinion means nothing. How, Everyone knows that. How slow do you drive? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, look, Chris, with, with, with this. Uh, <laughs> 
with this time that, that you all got back, essentially, from not you know, going down this, this corridor of we need to find, what did you reinvest in building instead, like since you weren't going in and, and fine tuning these models? It, yeah. Obviously, it freed some time up for you, right? Yeah, yeah, we did. I mean, we, we actually avoided spending a lot of investment on that. And so we were able to bring some other projects. I mean, this is less sexy, but some technical debt projects above the line, things that we hadn't been able to get to. Technical debt is the sexiest phrase. It, you it absolutely say. is. I, I like, oh. I, to be on a team that tackles technical debt, that's when I know I'm on the right team. That's yeah. great. Yeah, yep. Sorry yep. to interrupt. Go ahead. Because they're working on fitness. They're working on operational efficiency. They're working on improving things. Yeah. So that, that is hot. It is. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the other piece of it, we were able to really prove the art of the possible with how quickly we could get something out the door. You know, in about seven months, we were able to produce uh, with a high degree of editing, right? Our, our humans in the loop are involved in everything we do. The content starts with humans. And, and, and really what we're using Gen AI, Gen AI to do is all of that really challenging sort of l low apt aptitude work kind of in the middle to just aggregate and, and, and you know, find where the Eiffel Tower is mentioned as many places you ca as you can across the corpus of content and then organize that in a way where our editor can go through and say, I like that, I mm -hmm. think I should use that, this is unhelpful, it's maybe no longer accurate, et cetera, and then you know, build from that new, new asset. So I would also say we, we were able to get uh, things to market a lot faster and get it you know, really in front of the customers to determine do they like it, do they not like it. Um, rather than investing all that time, money, and effort up front, we were able to qu quickly get to some of those answers. Um, so yeah, I think that was probably one of the biggest wins of avoiding some of the highly complex uh, steps that I see so many companies, quite frankly, tanking that I, I don't think they need to. Yeah, and you define a really uh, clear application of using some kind of generative AI model, whether it be your own in-house custom model or something provided that's like maybe Claude or, mm -hmm. or something else, right? So uh, one of them is content summarization. So content summarization, taking this big corpus of text across not just one book, multiple books, and then being able to summarize it and have, maybe have like a copyright. So copywriting, copy editing, and, and summarizing it into a way where it's very easy for someone like an editor to be able to say, hey, here's a, a description of the book. Here's a description of a collection of books. Yeah, and you know, our, our editorial team still does a massive amount of work with all the outputs of this, right? It's got to it's gotta fall within our brand, our tone, uh, and Human in the Loop is always going to be critical for us. Again, it's sort of bookending and all that low cognitive, sort of low value, but high effort work is just being automated. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, we're getting some, some uh, love from chat about tech tech debt as well. Anyone okay. from the corporate world understands how far behind everyone is with technical debt and bugs going unfixed. So yeah, I mean, it does take, it takes a, a special team to, to address that. So that's great. And then, um, you know, we had some questions about how, how you all are applying Gen AI at uh, Lonely Planet. Um, can we talk a little bit more about that, Chris? Can we talk about, um, you know, how have your customers responded as as this has been introduced? Have you have you heard feedback? Yeah, yeah, we have not really heard feedback because it is so new with regard sure. to the assets that we've put out there. And and frankly, you know, none of the work that's actually going into production is pure Gen AI, right? Okay. It's all still being, the human in the loop. As correct, you said. the human in the loop. So it is being highly edited. It, all of our efficiencies are are really being looked at internally to okay. say again, let's let's move some of that extra effort out of the equation. Uh, so, you know, I think overall we are highly focused on gathering that feedback and being really methodical about where we take this technology next. Okay, that makes sense. I'm pulling up the, the testimonials page. Oh, are and you? I, hap I happen to see Lonely Planet on the testimonials page. It is there, yes. Yeah, and can you tell us more about how Lonely Planet is using um, Amazon Bedrock, maybe some of the models that you use, and how yeah. it's been able to help you trim your overall cost and the your increase your efficiency? Yeah, so you know what we're doing is we've implemented a retrieval augmented generation pipeline. Okay. And the foundation model from an LLM perspective that we're using is, is Anthropics Claude family of models. So that's, for the, for the overwhelming majority of what we're doing, that is the primary one. For some of the more nuanced extraction that we're doing, we're currently um, training uh, custom embedding models using SageMaker and Hugging Face okay. to 
um, you know, test into some of that. So for us, that's really how we've been able to uh, build this pipeline. We're still establishing yeah. a lot of what is the efficiency actually, because we're, you know, that lift is still really high. The outputs still need a lot of finessing to even be close right. to what we would feel comfortable putting in front of a customer. And that's where our, our content and editorial teams have been absolute superstars in this. I mean, they're the ones that make all of the magic of this business happen. Um, what we're trying to do is just make their lives a little bit easier from a testimonial perspective, when we were testing with a third party model that shall remain unnamed, <laughs> um, you know, the volume of text that we needed to scan, there were two things that were really important to us. Really large context window and lower sort of token cost. Okay. And Claude yeah. on Bedrock was really uh, the, the, the solution for us. And at the time when we did all of the math, it was 80% uh, from a model to model comparison more efficient. Wow. Well, yeah. And we all know that tokens, that's how the billing works, right? Mm -hmm. So if you yeah. have lower token costs, then your, your bill goes down. Correct. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk about, you know, I, I know, I, or I assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, even prior to, you know, working with, with generative AI or ML, I'm sure you all are a data-driven company as well, making decisions about your content based off the data coming in from your customers and things like that. Have you thought deeply about, um, how you're measuring the efficiencies that you're getting. Obviously, you mentioned the efficiencies you're getting at this point with, with generative AI, helping your editorial staff internally, uh, making things more efficient. How are you all measuring that there uh, at Lindley Planet? Are you, are you uh, gathering you know, feedback from, from the editing staff? You know, did uh, this take X amount of time less or things like that? Yeah, the process is very manual. We are we are gathering that feedback, and our, our findings are, are mixed. It just really depends on the use case and the sure. content asset that we're talking about. You know, if we're talking about Sicily, that's a little more compact. There's less there. But yeah. imagine Italy as a guidebook. I didn't bring it on purpose. It's probably about this thick. I wish and you had. A lot more. <laughs> to go, great for a carry-on bag. Um, it's a lot more complicated to work through something like that. So we are in the in the early days, and I think there's, you know, there's definitely some skepticism, and I think we've got our challenge that we need to work through, but you know right. we're just being transparent and yeah. and understand what the understanding what the limitations of the technology are. But I think we can all agree that the pace of change in this space and the, the improvement in oh, the models yeah. yes. is just astronomical. So right. um, you know it's a highly collaborative process, and we're continuing to work through it. You know, very manual, saying you know how long would it have taken you to, you know go find all of this content yourself. There are right. some scenarios where it's like, it wouldn't make sense because you're, you be, you're not going to scan thousands of pages of, of content to find where something is mentioned every time. Right. And as we know, LLMs are non-deterministic. So yes. it also, I can't ever guarantee that it's going to pull out 100% of the mentions of a place. So the answer is it's tricky, but we're working through it. Well, yeah. I think it's fascinating too. I would at some point, maybe we can go hang out later, Chris. I would want to hear more about like measuring the efficiency of content, you know, for travel guides. Like that already is fascinating to me from like an engineering perspective, uh, let alone, you know, introducing, uh, hey, now we're also putting generative AI into the mix. That, uh, we don't have time for that, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> we do have a question from chat, you know, uh, asking about uh, how often are you having to rerun, you know, like your prompt, for example. How often are you uh, not getting usable things for the requests that you're making? Yeah. Look, I think it, it, it's it's definitely slowed over time. In the early days, it was hundreds of iterations a day as we continue wow. to sort of add more context and sort of ask ourselves a question. Did this make it better? And we were also doing all of this so early in the bedrock days, and 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 Claude was was really so new to the to the to the service that you know we were even going to the experts and they were saying, yeah, let's try this. So we were very experimental. We were you know mm -hmm. very early adopter of uh, the technology with AWS. So you know what I would say is you know hundreds if not thousands of times, and we we continue to iterate it. Uh, the good news is like with itinerary assembly. That was a little easier because, okay. um, and I shouldn't say easy, it was definitely challenging, but there were more f specific rules that we were able to say, only put these things into an itinerary or a day if they're like geospatially possible to do and if we would recommend it. And it was good at doing the first thing, less good at if we would actually recommend it as travel experts, right? Okay. So that requires and still does require a lot more uh, work as we continue to work with our teams to both edit the outputs, but also try to refine the prompts and the rules that are behind 
You mentioned this one thing, itinerary assembler. You, you had me stuck on that, and I was like, is that like a new programming language or something? <laughs> like, it is not. It is not. Can you yeah, just break not. it down for our viewers here? Like, what is the itinerary assembler? Definitely not from me. It's, oh, Chris, it's for do, everyone else. Do, do you want, uh, we're running short on time. As we're explaining that, do you want to yeah. show us some of this stuff too? Yeah, absolutely. So part of what we built was not just an extraction and summarization, but we also built a, a pipeline um, leveraging large language models to uh, bring these points of interest together into days, and then ultimately itineraries that were then reviewed by experts and, and modified for uh, what we would recommend as Lonely Planet. So why don't we go to Madrid? Yeah, why not? Let's go to Madrid. Okay, that, all right. That's actually, Chris's great. Screen. That's on my list of places to go for sure. Awesome. All right, well, this is really, you know, we're in Madrid now, and this itinerary was, you know, initially extracted. And it looks the and same, assembled. actually. Looks, yeah, yeah. It looks very similar. I mean, they have a very good, very consistent build out process. The whole summit moved. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Incredible. Generative AI is amazing. <laughs> this is, yeah, wow. Really okay. amazing. <laughs> New feature. I wasn't aware. I yeah, teleportation. Today. Okay, interesting. All right. So like, let's get into it. So first and foremost, there's a overview of Madrid. I'm not gonna read it to you. I think you all can read it and, and the viewers can read it. But you know, this comes together to kind of give a perspective on the what and the why behind the itinerary. This is, you know, each number here essentially is a day. And, and the, the itinerary that I brought up for you was a seven day itinerary um, that, you know, really starts with day one as a taste of Madrid's history, arts, and culture. So you can see there's a, there's a map view of all the points that we're sending you to. And this was all brought together by large language models based on a number of rules. And again, that had to be edited because it was very good at saying these things are close together, so right. do them, and less good at saying, like, this is what we would actually want somebody to do that's on this trip. So, you know, that's what we're grappling with right now, and that's why our, our editorial team is, you know, truly the, the magic behind um, all of this. So, interestingly enough, it also brings forward our POI content from our website. So, the mm -hmm. first place we're sending you on day one is the Palacio Reel. It explains why. You can click out to it or save it um, and, and start to build your own punch list of things. And, you know, that's really the gist of it. So, so the itinerary assembly um, really is just, you know, our, us using large language models to say, now that we've extracted things, put these things together, and then, of course, all that has to get edited. That's very interesting. It is. Yeah, it's pretty cool, huh? I like this a lot. Can I access this? You can. How do I get to it? It's on LonelyPlanet.com. What? Okay, <laughs> walk me through this. How do I get there? LonelyPlanet.com. Yep, slash itineraries. Slash itineraries. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to type this live. Itineraries. Slash explore. I hope I spelled that right. Explore. Dash. Da dash. Madrid. Madrid. Dash. This dash. is a great. Oh, yeah, look at look great. at look at those. Look what at are those? those? I, are those? Those, those are churros. churros. Those are churros, those churros? dipped okay. in chocolate. And that's a whole cup of chocolate. That is. Can I yes. just drink the chocolate? Doesn't it make you want to go? Uh, yes. I we I don't have to though because we're already here. You How do we know that's But you still have to go out the door. And not really thick espresso. <laughs> I guess it could be. You know, it <laughs> could a, be some sort sugar, of soup. You sugar don't caffeine know what it rush. Is. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I would just drink that. Now, you don't even need the churro. It's kind of getting in the way of the chocolate. Um, but that Madrid, like a local expert, curated itinerary. You got it. Like a local expert, uh, curated <laughs> itinerary. <laughs> this, is, this is fascinating. Live. Yeah, yeah. I, this is. I really. This is good TV. I got it. I got it. You we, got it. We no, didn't practice this. No, no. no lie. This is live. Like, can I get a close up? It is right there. Right yeah. there. You can okay. get to it too. I'm gonna drop that link in the chat for everyone. Yeah, and you know, we try to give a little bit of you know shopping and, and different types of experiences mixed throughout. We don't want to send people to three restaurants in a row, right? Sometimes right. the sometimes the large language models thought our people were very, very hungry. Sure. So, you yeah. know, it is they a were built iterative for me, process. Chris. Uh, nice. You know, uh, maybe four or five meals in one sitting. That's that's my go to. I travel the world through my stomach. Yeah. Uh, Chris, let me ask you before we run out of time. Because I want to hear, what are you excited about after working with this? I think that bringing the entire travel experience together for consumers is a problem that has not been solved. Yeah, there's agreed. booking, there's planning, dreaming, and inspiration, there's experiencing, and, and a whole host of other modes of travel. It's incredibly hard. I mean, even just choosing one restaurant on a trip, do you go to, do you go to a search engine and type restaurants near me and just blindly pick the first one that's returned? <laughs> Maybe. 
<laughs> well, you shouldn't do that. I Just shouldn't. type in food. I've, I've gotten <laughs> sick that way. Food substance <laughs> for humans to consume. That's, that's my search. That's I like... I like this because it takes a lot of the thinking out of what I have to do for a trip. It provides a really clear itinerary. Yeah. I can still review it, maybe make some changes to it, but it's a really great starting point. Yeah. Well, Chris, I'm excited to see how you tackle this problem that you're excited about uh, at Lonely Planet, because I know, I know you're going to. Yeah. I can tell just, yes. just in the 20 minutes that I've spent with you. Uh, thank you for joining us, first of all. Thank you. Anything you want to leave the audience as, before we have to wrap up? Yeah, I think the number one learning that we've seen is just make sure that you test into your use cases. Don't commit to one model or one piece of technology. I've talked to so many companies that have done significant volume of POC work, and it never makes it to production. And, and that's why. You need to really work back from your customer, work back from the problem that you're trying to solve. Don't solution it until you really understand it. I love that advice. That's, that's perfect advice, I think, that, Aaron. That's, that's an ending note. All right. Speaking of, stick around because we will be back with more.